What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. I'm Nicholas. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat, BDGE Fantasy Football. Today we're going to talk about some draft strategy. Some 2019 fantasy football early round draft strategy. Shout out YouTube. Shout out the SEO. We've done a lot of player analysis. It's what I've dug into for basically at least three times a week for the last like five months. Guys I like, guys I don't like, guys I kind of like, guys I kind of hate, whatever, whatever. So in honor of the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Bible releasing earlier on Monday in the draft guide on bigdogsdraftguide.com. We're going to talk about strategy because that's exactly what that article is. And since I've been looking at the players for so long, right, I've been able to see the different trends, tier gaps, where there's values at which positions. And I want to pass that knowledge on to y'all. Today's show is sponsored by the Sleeper app. If you are not on Sleeper, if you have not moved your fantasy football league over to Sleeper yet, you are doing fantasy football wrong. This is the new up and coming best thing out right now, sort of like Big Dogs Gotta Eat in the fantasy football industry, go download the Sleeper app. You can add me. My username is Nick BDGE. If you are a Patreon member, which you could join, patreon.com slash BDGE, I will give you the link to a private forum where all the big dogs are on and you can ask any of your fantasy football questions. So download the Sleeper app. I will link it down below. Add me. Go to patreon.com slash BDGE. You sign up there, I will hit you with that forum link. That's all I got to say for now. Let's dive into the video. If at any point you're enjoying the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you are new, we're bringing heat five days a week, every single weekday. Let's get it. Before we jump in, I will be giving away one draft guide. Along with the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Bible, there's a whole lot of information in there. This is the only thing you literally need for your 2019 fantasy football season. It's rankings, it's sleepers, it's busts, it's must-own players. Everything updated thoroughly throughout the entire summer. Available on the computer, on the laptop, on the phone, everywhere, y'all. This is the only resource you need for your fantasy football draft. So I will be giving one away. For today's episode, the question you need to answer is, who is your 101 right now? Half PPR. Who is the 101 and why? Comment that down below and you will automatically be entered into the draft guide giveaway, which I will give away next Wednesday. Let's talk some general strategy for this year. I get this question all the time. Hey, Nick, should I go running back, running back, wide receiver? Should I go wide receiver, wide receiver, running back, tight end? Should I go running back, tight end, wide receiver, quarterback, wide receiver, running back, wide receiver, running back, running back, running back? It's like, yeah, let me tell you what your first 10 rounds should be without even knowing who the fuck is on the board. So what if I tell you to start wide receiver, wide receiver, and Alvin Kamara falls to the 109? You're not going to pick him because I told you to go wide receiver? Please just don't be that guy. Don't ask those type of questions because I don't know who's on the board. You should never go into your draft knowing exactly what positions you are going to be attacking. You always have to be fluid. You always have to be welcome to the fact that someone might fall to you or a guy you like who might typically go around later, you might have to target earlier. When you're projecting the beginning of the draft, you have a much clearer picture of which guys are going to be available to you. But once you hit like pick 15 overall, it's a shit show. It becomes a free for all and guys are starting to get picked all over the place. The other thing that makes projecting this year so damn difficult is this, right? Someone tweeted out to me saying how running backs are crazy thin this year. I said, this is what makes drafting this year so tough. Running back is so thin after the top. Everyone is reaching so far on anything promising at the running back position. And the fact that most of the top running backs that you should have been able to feel good about have big question marks, right? In February or January, right after the season ended, you're feeling good about Todd Gurley. You're feeling good about Melvin Gordon, about Zeke, about Mixon. All of those guys have monster question marks. Gurley, obviously, with his arthritis. Melvin Gordon and Zeke, both dealing with possible holdouts. Mixon's got both of his, two of his linemen, his first round pick, plus AJ Green off the field now for whatever amount of time. So a lot of injuries and an offense that might not be that good. It pretty much knocks out the, like a half of the first round or at least half of the running backs that would have gone in the first round. What makes it so difficult to predict what's going to happen is now some of these guys, some of these guys might still go in the first round of some of your drafts. Some of them might fall to the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth round. Shit's going to get crazy. So you've got to always have player analysis in mind. Understand the value, the tiers between players, right? There's tiers in rankings, which all my rankings in the draft guide are broken down by tiers. And you have to understand going at it by a positional standpoint, or that's your strategy, is not going to work because this year is just so messy. So let's talk about wide receivers and running backs. That is what ex pretty much makes up the whole first and second round. At the end of the day, or at the end of the season, running backs win fantasy football leagues, right? There's no way around it. This year alone, looking at FFPC data, which is high stakes, season long leagues, the top 12 running backs are gone in fantasy drafts by pick 207. So after less than a round and a half of your fantasy football draft, 
the top 12 running backs, the RB1s, are off the board. I'm talking about non-super flex and non-tight end premium. Top 12 running backs are off the board by pick 207. 50% of the first three rounds, so out of the first three rounds, which are 36 picks, 50% of them, 18 running backs will be off the board. Again, running backs win leagues, but they also lose leagues because the few first rounds are loaded with running backs. However, if you bust or if you miss on one of your First two, even three picks, that puts you in a massive hole compared to your opponents. And parallel to that point, running backs bust at a pretty high rate. A high enough rate that it might not be worth pulling the trigger on a second tier running back because you want to have a workhorse running back in your lineup. Because the numbers show that just because you assume one to be, there's a high probability that they are in fact not. So what I did was I went back over the last five years looking at ADP data and the finishes of running backs in fantasy football relative to their ADP. And I've used this in my videos before. On average, over the last five seasons, 50% of running backs that were drafted as a top 12 fantasy running back finish outside of the top 12. So six out of 12 on average are not going to be top 12 at the end of the year. On average, 4.2 out of 12 or 35% of those top 12 drafted running backs will finish outside of the top 18. And on average, 3.5 3.5 or 29.6% will finish outside of the top 24, which is a complete, if you're drafting someone outside of the, or inside the top 12, which we already went over, is within the first round and a half, and they finish outside of the top 18 at their position, that is a complete bust in my opinion. And considering the draft capital, man, you have to take that into account. It's monumental when you miss on a guy like that. Some of these busts came by way of injury. Others, you know, simply turned into a running back by committee. Others were just bad, bad play calling, bad coaching. Nonetheless, they exist, right? These problems happen for running backs. But these are the facts. They're the big facts. Now, when we look at wide receivers, there's a common saying that the high-end fantasy wide receivers are a lot safer than high-end fantasy running backs. We wanted to see, is that true? So the same way we looked at the bust rate for running backs, we looked at it for wide receivers. Of the wide receivers drafted in the top 12, 5.4% will not finish inside the top 12. So it's a little bit of a nominal rate. It's 0.6 wide receivers fewer, but it's also 5% fewer. Same amount finish outside of the top 18, few less finished outside of the top 24. The rate is a bit higher for running backs who not finish as an elite RB1, but also their floor seems to be a little bit lower for the ones that don't hit, don't finish as a top 12 running back. A few less of them fall out of the top 24 as well. So for wide receivers, you can say, yes, it is a little bit safer, but not by a massive, massive amount. The other thing to note though, is when I was doing this, I did all this work manually and wrote down the names of all the players over the last five years and shit. Far, far, far majority of wide receivers that ended up busting or not finishing in the top 12, top 18, top 24 were because of injuries. Most of them that played those years, whether it was 14 games, 12 games, eight games, were very good on a points per game basis, but injuries derailed them. From a running back standpoint, the reason I think I feel like they're not as safe is because they have a lot of outs. There's a lot of outlets in which they cannot finish inside that top 12, and I named them before. It's running back by committees. It's not being used on the goal line. It's not being used in the pass catching sense of things. It's play calling. It's just being on bad offenses overall. So what are we getting at in terms of where you are drafting and what we can help you with? I laughed at this tweet because I, I, after I tweeted that original thing about, you know, RBs being so thin, some Justin said, so what are you saying is pray to the fantasy guys, you get a top four pick. And I pretended that that was basically all that was in the big dogs got to eat Bible this year. Yeah. Basically you're praying for a top four pick so you can get one of those elite running backs. There is no larger advantage in fantasy football than getting a top tier elite running back. And don't confuse elite with an RB1. I'm talking about elite. I'm talking about the Todd Gurley's of the last two years. I'm talking about Saquon Barkley, Christian McCaffrey, Melvin Gordon when he's on the field. Owning David Johnson last year and spewing out that, oh, he was RB10, so he was actually a good pick. That didn't help a single fucking person. David Johnson averaged literally a full 10 half PPR fantasy points per game fewer than Todd Gurley did year. 10 fantasy points per game fewer in half PPR than Todd Gurley did last year. Oh, but you got your RB1. Yeah, that's how you fucking lose your league. Having an elite RB1 gives you a massive positional advantage. If you have a top four pick this year, it's Barkley, it's Zeke, it's Kamara, C-Mac. In no particular order, however you see them, and depending on the the standard scoring format, If you want to know what my rankings are, again, that's in the draft guide, bigdogsdraftguide.com. Most of you will throw David Johnson coming into this year in that top elite tier as well. Sure. After that, then what, right? After the top four or five picks, you have to be looking at snagging an elite wide receiver. And this is a mock draft I set up on Sleeper. And you could do this. You could set up your own mock drafts and you could draft with your friends and stuff. So again, go download Sleeper, use a link down below to get it. And what we'll see is I'll let the computer auto pick. You're going to see a lot of the same 
same draft picks going on over and over again in every league, pretty much. Saquon, Christian McCaffrey, Zeke, and Kamara. After that, it becomes a free-for-all because there's not much of a value dip anywhere. We have DeAndre Hopkins, we have David Johnson, and then when you're sitting at like the 107, 108, I'm looking at an elite wide receiver here. I want one of those top guys. If you can't get Devonta Adams, if you can't get DeAndre Hopkins, I'm still looking at the next group of wide receivers in the first round. It's Odell Beckham Jr., it's Julio Jones, it's Juju, it's Michael Thomas. So after round one, things get very, very dicey, and there's a big reason why. No one likes starting wide receiver, wide receiver, right? I hate it. Two elite guys are going to be waiting there for you, and they're very, 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 very safe compared to the running backs that you're seeing around them. And I'm going to get into minimizing risk in a second. We love to minimize risk early on in our drafts. However, when you look at the running back landscape as a whole, you have to ask yourself if you need a running back early. Do you need to draft a running back early? What I've concluded, unfortunately, is yes. You pretty much do have to grab a top tier running back with one of your first two picks. If you're in the beginning of the first first round, that's easy because you take one of the top four or five guys. If you're at the end, it gets a little bit tougher because those elite wide receivers are waiting there for you. That's why I think you, you should take one of the elite wide receivers in the first round and have one of those second, third tier running backs in the second round. There's not much of a value jump, right? If you want to use your first round pick on a guy like Joe Mixon, it doesn't make much sense to me because you're you're missing out on a guy like DeAndre Hopkins or Devontae Adams when in round two, you're still going to be able to get probably Dalvin Cook or possibly Joe Mixon or Nick Chubb, which is not a big value drop off from that, from that running back. The other problem with not getting a running back early, if you're at the back end of the first round, right? We like safety, but when you look at the other players overall, just in, in fantasy football drafts this year, there might be four or five guys outside of the first, I don't know, five or six rounds that have any sort of realistic top 15 running back upside. It's Rashad Penny, Miles Sanders, maybe Royce Freeman, Darius Geis if he's healthy. Overall, this year is just not deep whatsoever at running back. So it sucks, but you might have to reach for a running back in those first two rounds. But let's get back into talking about minimizing risk. What do we mean by minimizing risk? There are a few things in fantasy football that I think make a player extremely risky. It's being in a bad offense because they won't score a lot of points, which means your fantasy player, for the most part, if you're playing the percentages, right? Nothing's black and white, but if you're playing the percentages, what gives you the best odd of succeeding? A bad offense usually turns out to be a bad fantasy player for the most part. Injury concerns, being in a running back by committee. Your top four or so picks should be putting up around, you know, 50 to 60% of your weekly fantasy production, depending on how big your league is. If you're playing with a starting roster of like 12 players, then it'll be a little bit less, but you get the point. Right In a normal league where you're starting a quarterback, two running backs, two wide receivers, a tight end, maybe a flex or two, those top four picks have to be putting up 50 to 60% of your fantasy points, right? And it's kind of an estimate. You say your first round pick is maybe putting up 18 points a game. Second round is 14. Third round, maybe 12 and a half. Fourth round, 11 points a game or something like that. So it's a lot of production. If you miss out on any one of those guys, if any of them busts, you're at a huge disadvantage straight from the rip. And it's very hard to crawl out of that hole. And of course, the earlier you make a pick that's risky, the more points you expect from that player, meaning it's more important and it's more of a gamble that you hit on that guy. You know what I mean? So every round that a player falls down, every every time that a player you like falls down an extra round, their value shoots up because their risk decreases. Their upside doesn't, their floor on their upside does not change, right? A player's statistics are gonna be a player's statistics at the end of the year. However, the value in that draft spot makes it way higher because it's less of a risk because you're not actually depending on second round points, right? Whereas your second rounder needs to put up 14 points, your third rounder only needs to put up 11. So it's a lot less risky depending on a player like that in a round later, which is exactly why I'm so adamant on staying away from guys like Devonta Freeman, Todd Gurley, Leonard Fournette, like Antonio Browns. Would I be shocked if they finished at what their current price is, the RB 12 or 14, a third round price or whatever? No, I would not, despite popular belief, despite what you might think, but why take the gamble there when the guys getting picked around them have similar upside, similar floor, are not injury risks, are on good teams with good offenses and are talented players. There's no reason to add that extra risk into your top two or three picks. It's a long season. Shit happens, of course, right? There are injuries, whatever. But going straight upside is almost a surefire way for you to lose your lead. You're going to fall out quickly. Yes, if you hit on all your upside picks, you're probably going to end up winning your league. But as a seasoned fantasy player, which I hope some of you guys feel like you are at this point after listening to me for a while, give me that floor of my fantasy team being really productive week over week that keeps me in the second, third, fourth place playoff hunt for the entirety of the year because 
I know I'm on top of my shit and I'm going to be able to navigate the waiver wire smoothly. And I'm going to help y'all throughout the season navigate the waiver wire smoothly as well. I'm going to be able to make trades, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Smart and steady wins the race when it comes to fantasy football. The first place guy, whoever's in first in your league, if he's 11 and 0 or 10 and 1 or whatever, he probably had a ton of luck and he probably hit on a lot of his high upside picks. But so what? At the end of the year, all you have to do is get into the dance and minimizing risk will almost ensure that you get into the dance. You certainly want upside, but you want to save that for later in the draft. Now, back to talking about wide receivers being safe and running backs being a little bit risky. Reaching for the running back just seems like something you have to do because it's this particular year and I'm seeing the trends that are going on in fantasy football. If you fade the running back position early, you are not going to like your roster how it turns out. A minimizing risk normally would be, yes, OBJ and Julio Jones or Devonte Adams and Juju, right? But this year, the problem with it is a month ago, if you asked me this, I would have gladly, I would have gladly went with two stud wide receivers because there was actually actually value in the running backs in the third and fourth round. But like I said, I've been doing prep for a long time and I'm seeing all the trends. And now those guys who are in the third and fourth round are one, no longer safe. Two, their ADPs are shooting up because of the hype. You look at Carrion Johnson, right? Riddick gets cut. So now his ADP is moving up into the second round pretty much. And that does not factor in any of the downside getting baked into Carrion Johnson in the second round. Running back by committee, shitty offense, injury concerns, etc. Marlon Mack, Andrew Luck's calf has to be healthy if Marlon Mack is going to succeed the way I think he is going to. Aaron Jones dealing with a hamstring injury, right? That's someone that's dealt with like two or three MCL tears already. That's a big concern. We know hamstring injuries can be very serious. They are not serious up front, but if you don't rest them for an allotted amount of time, they can turn very serious very quickly and, and linger throughout the season. Damian Williams also dealing with a hamstring injury. Derrick Henry dealing with a calf strain. Guys, it's like, holy shit, all of the value that was there and made me okay Fading running backs in rounds one and two and just stacking up two or three of these guys, right? If you can get Devontae Adams and then Juju Smith-Schuster as your wide receiver one and two, and then in the third and fourth rounds, end up with like a Karrion Johnson, Marlon Mack stack, I would absolutely love that. However, that's not going to be the case for most people. So now you're looking at it, you know, where those top guys, Gurley, Gordon, Zeke, Mixon, are not good first round picks. Plus you have all these third round picks who are either going too high or not good third round picks anymore because they're injured. It makes things very, very difficult. Just a quick side note, injury optimism is too fucking real. If there is one thing that I want you to take away from this video, just as a better fantasy football player, and I say this a lot, do not find injuries in fantasy football because they will find you. If a player is injured going into the year, do not draft him. As I've been saying, basically, we like to get that elite wide receiver one. And then in the second round, here we go. We have Dalvin Cook there. We have Nick Chubb waiting for me. So I will take, you know, whatever. I'll take Dalvin Cook just for the general purpose of strategy. The good thing about all these middling running back twos shooting up draft boards so much with all the hype around them is that the wide receiver position, the value in wide receiver positions in rounds three, four, even five is so deep, is so good. So you can grab Marlon Mack, Karen Johnson, Aaron Jones, Henry, if they're available in round three, if you got your RB1 in round two, you can grab one of these guys in round three, assuming one of them are healthy, and then still hammer great options at wide receiver for your wide receiver two. If I already went Devontae Adams, in the fourth round, guys that are getting picked in the fourth round right now, Stephon Diggs, Brandon Cooks, Robert Woods, Kenny Galladay. It's absurd when you compare them to the running backs that are going in the same category. Mark Ingram, David Montgomery, Josh Jacobs, Philip Lindsay, James White. Like, what the fuck is going on, people? So if you got an early pick, yes, hammer that running back. And I honestly wouldn't be upset if you did it again. If a Dalvin Cook or a Nick Chubb fell to you at the end of the second round, hammer that again because there's still so much wide receiver value. You could, you might even be able to get like Dalvin Cook at the end of the second, then Mike Evans, Robert Woods, Tyler Boyd or Tyler Lockett or something like that. Like that is a fantastic start four or five rounds in. If you are in a full PPR or a league where you start three wide receivers, I'm perfectly okay going with two of those elite wide receivers off the rip if you are at the back end of the first round. They obviously score way more points in a full PPR league. What that also does is opens up more running backs, right? We're talking about how running backs are not deep in fantasy football this year. However, in a full PPR league, it opens up depth to the point that guys like James White, guys like Tariq Cohen, the pass catching backs have a lot more value in full PPR leagues. So the position gets a little bit deeper, meaning you have a little bit more leverage with going with those elite wide receivers in the beginnings of the rounds. Now let's talk about tight ends. Let's talk about the top three tight ends. Do we want to draft one of them within the first three rounds? I've been saying this almost weekly in my mock drafts. I do them every Friday, right? I do them on draft.com. 
If you want a mock draft, if you want to draft with me, head over to draft.com slash BDGE. You could use promo code BDGE for $3 to draft with, and I will invite you to the draft. Just add me. My username is Nick Ercolano. I'll put that all in the description down below. I usually say I love leaving the first three rounds with one of the elite tight ends, right? Kelsey in the second round, sometimes in the first, or one of those other two, Ertz or Kittle in the third rounds. I'm okay with that. Those are best ball drafts, people. Those are best ball drafts. This is season long. When you're in a best ball draft, you could use a top two or three pick on a tight end because you can still stack up six or seven running backs and you don't have to decide when to start them. In a season long league, you want to have confidence in your running backs. You don't have to pick and choose between eighth and ninth round running backs because that usually won't work. So using a top three round pick on a tight end in a year where running back is so not deep is very, very risky. In a tight end premium, Kelsey is the 105. For those of y'all that don't know what a tight end premium is, it's usually whatever your PPR settings are. If it's a half PPR, tight ends will get full PPR. If it's standard, tight ends will get half PPR. If it's full PPR, tight ends will get 1.5 PPR. Kelsey ends up being the wide receiver one, no questions asked. If he didn't have a tight end sticker next to his name and he had a wide receiver sticker next to his name, he would easily be consensus 105 in tight end premium leagues. And I'm sure he is at this point. I actually haven't looked at the ADP. As we dove into, the running back position is not deep. So passing on the running backs in those second and third rounds, or if you're an early pick in the first round, is very, very risky. I've done a ton of mock drafts and real drafts outside of best ball. And when I go with tight end early, when I go one of the top three guys, not saying that Kelsey's not a fantastic value and he has great positional advantage, but the rest of your team suffers because this is a year where the running back depth is not there. There is a ton of wide receiver depth. In rounds three, four, five, you can get your elite wide receiver in either one or two. Rounds three, four, five has great value. And then again, in rounds like eight, nine, 10, but we're only talking about earlier on draft strategy right now. So while I think there is a lot of value in Kelsey in the second round, even the first round, to be honest with you, and one of those other two guys in the third round, I tend to shy away from it and grab one of the second tier tight ends in the fifth, sixth, or seventh round. So I hope some of that made sense to y'all because I just spewed out a lot of words. Hopefully some of those were big facts. Hopefully some of those helped you. I think the the key thing to take away here is that the running back situation is very, 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 very messy. So you need to be looking to get some of those running backs early on. I don't love fading elite wide receivers. I wouldn't say the top end wide receiver ones are a luxury and that you don't need them, but I also wouldn't say it's a necessity. So if you do find yourself starting off with running back, running back, or even running back, running back, running back, if the right players fall to you, I'm okay with that because there's so much value at wide receiver later on in the draft. However, you do need to probably hit that running back button, the cop button on running backs, and at least once in the first two rounds, possibly twice in the first three rounds, depending on the players. Obviously, we're going to like different players. Some guys I like that you hate, some guys you hate that I like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I hope this draft strategy video helped you out. If it did, let me know in the comment section down below what other kind of videos you would like to see. I want to know who your 101 is and why one person will be picked to win a draft guide for commenting that answer down below. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're going five days a week videos at the HQ. Download the Sleeper app. Again, thank you Sleeper for sponsoring this video. The link will be down there. If you are a Patreon member, patreon.com slash BDGE, I will invite you to a private forum. You will also get access to private live streams where you could ask me any of your personal fantasy football questions. Patreon.com slash BDGE. Go cop the draft guide, bigdogsdraftguide.com. All of this nonsense will be linked down below in the description. I love you for sticking around for this long, and I'll see y'all on tomorrow's Fade the Public where we interview Evan motherfucking Silva. Peace.